Good afternoon. I'm Kelly Waters, a health communications specialist on the Emergency Partners Information Connection Team in CDC's Center for Preparedness and Response, Division of Emergency Operations. Thank you for joining us for today's EPIC webinar titled Travelers Health Summer 2019. Today we will hear from CDC's Dr. Jeff Nemhauser. If you do not wish for your participation to be recorded, please exit at this time. You can earn continuing education by completing this webinar. Instructions are on how to earn continuing education can be found on our website, emergency.cdc.gov backslash EPIC. The course access code is EPIC0522, EPIC0522, with all the letters capitalized. To repeat, the course access code to receive continuing education units is, in all caps, EPIC0522. Today's webinar is interactive. To make a comment, click the chat button on your screen and then enter your thoughts. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button. The Q&A session will begin after our presenter has finished. Closed captioning is available for this webinar. The button to enable this function can be found either at the top or bottom of your screen. We are fortunate to have Dr. Jeff Nemhauser as our speaker today. He is a captain in the U.S. Public Health Service and a senior medical officer in the Travelers Health Branch of CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. He is also the Editor-in-Chief of CDC Health Information for International Travel, nicknamed the Yellow Book. He received his medical degree from Hahnemann University School of Medicine in Philadelphia. He is board certified in emergency medicine. Thank you for joining us today, Jeff. Please begin. Thanks, Kelly, and welcome to everybody in the audience. Hello from Atlanta. I'm gonna spend some time today introducing you all to the topic of international travel health or travel medicine, and give you some information that you can use and share with others to help make sure that trips begin and end healthy. If you'll see the objective slide, you'll see that there are four main areas where I'll be focusing my time with you. And these areas include giving you some awareness of current travel health concerns or what's new in traveler's health, I'm going to talk to you about new or newish developments in travel medicine. I'm going to talk about how to prepare yourself and others for healthy international travel. And at the end, I'll be sharing some of the resources that you and others can access as you're preparing to go overseas. So let's begin. Now, before we get started, let me introduce the branch where I work. Who are we? Well, the Travelers Health Branch is a group of physicians, scientists, and health communicators dedicated to the mission of protecting the health of U.S. residents traveling internationally or who are living abroad. And what do we do to help achieve that mission? We study and monitor illnesses and to a much lesser degree injury among travelers. We also work with partners to learn about and then monitor disease outbreaks and other health threats in destinations around the world. These are health threats that can have serious health implications for travelers and expatriates, and we want them to know about them. We currently do that using our travel health notice mechanism, and I'm going to talk about that later on in the lecture. We provide guidance and advice to international travelers and healthcare providers about what vaccines are needed uh, when they're going to certain areas of the world, areas where vaccine preventable diseases such as yellow fever are endemic. We also make recommendations about prophylactic medications that travelers need to take to prevent diseases such as malaria. We communicate our guidance and recommendations to a variety of different audiences. While our traditional audience has been the international traveler and healthcare provider, we know that we have a much larger, larger audience than that, including public health, the travel industry, and others. And last, 
we develop and distribute event-specific advice regarding the risks of travel during emergencies. We can do this using the travel health notice mechanism I just mentioned, as well as by posting information on our CDC website. As I said at the outset, one of my goals for today's presentation is to give you all some awareness of new topics in traveler's health. It seems like every day there's something new going on in the area of traveler's health. Just open a newspaper or go online to your preferred news outlet and you'll find it. From vector-borne diseases like yellow fever, Zika, dengue, chikungunya, to older, more well-known, better established diseases that we thought we'd actually eradicated like measles, international travel is a risk factor for exposure and potential infection. And speaking of measles, there's been a tremendous resurgence in this disease worldwide. CDC is tracking about 30 countries right now where outbreaks are occurring and ongoing. And that includes places like the United Kingdom, France, and Japan, countries that, like the United States, had eradicated or nearly eradicated the disease. In the US, where measles had been declared eradicated, there have been at least two large outbreaks. We know that most cases of measles in this country come from people who pick up the disease during international travel. It's highly contagious and travelers without immunity can be infected easily. We also know that the best way to prevent illness is to be vaccinated before going overseas. The measles branch at CDC partnered with the Travelers Health Branch to update the guidance we provide travelers on our country destination pages. With all the outbreaks of measles in countries around the world, more than ever, we really want to make sure that travelers going overseas are properly immunized or otherwise demonstrate adequate immunity so that they don't get sick and that they don't bring the illness home with them to potentially vulnerable, unvaccinated, non-immune communities. Dengue is another disease that we're expecting to see uh, impact travelers more heavily this year. Dengue is caused by infection with any of four single-stranded RNA viruses named, simply enough, dengue virus 1, 2, 3, or 4. It's a vector-borne disease transmitted by the Aedes mosquito, mainly Aegypti and Albopictus, the same mosquito species that carry Zika and other flaviviruses. The disease is endemic throughout the tropics and is a cause of febrile illness in travelers returning from Latin America, the Caribbean, and Southeast Asia. Each year, up to 400 million people get infected with dengue. Approximately 100 million people get sick from infection and 22,000 die from severe disease. Now about 75% of infections are asymptomatic and even symptomatic dengue is usually a mild, nonspecific illness. The big concern though are those with severe, life-threatening disease. And if left untreated, the risk of death in those with severe dengue approaches 10%. After a person's recovered from dengue fever, they have immunity to the type of virus that infected them, but not to the other three types of dengue fever virus. The risk of developing severe dengue fever, also known as dengue hemorrhagic fever, increases if infected a third or fourth time. Unfortunately, Ebola is also back in the news. This time, it's in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's the second largest Ebola outbreak in history. And unlike the unprecedented outbreak of the disease in West Africa that began five years ago, this outbreak is occurring in a region of Africa where there's political instability that's making it hard for agencies to respond with appropriate public health measures to help control the outbreak. Things like contact tracing, isolation of cases, and immunization of contacts. And as you can see on the slide, as of the end of April, there were nearly 1,500 cases and almost 1,000 deaths attributed to the disease. In terms of drug-resistant infections, just as travelers can bring back infections such as measles and dengue with them, they can also import uh, drug-resistant infections, infections that are rare or highly unusual to see in the United States. Asking about a travel history is critical to making the correct diagnosis for the individual 
and for identifying a larger public health threat among travelers returning from particular destinations. In 2014 and 2015, travelers to India, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and other countries returned to the U.S. with shigellosis, resulting in a large outbreak of ciprofloxacin-resistant Shigella sanii infections. Among men who have sex with men, there have been outbreaks of infections caused by multi-drug resistant Shigella, including isolates resistant to azithromycin or, ciprofloxac or ciprofloxacin, and that includes in the United States, Australia, parts of Europe, Taiwan, and Canada. We also know that people who travel internationally to receive health care, called medical tourism, can be at increased risk for infection with drug-resistant organisms. Last year, CDC worked with state and local health departments to identify U.S. residents who traveled to the Dominican Republic to have cosmetic surgery. Several were identified with surgical wounds infected with non-tuberculous mycobacteria. More recently, the United States referred to a hospital, the, you, excuse me, more recently, U.S. residents who were referred to a hospital in Mexico, specifically in Tijuana for bariatric surgery, had a higher than expected rate of wounds infected with carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a particularly difficult to treat organism. And finally, this was reported widely in the news, Candida auris, another particularly difficult to treat organism, this uh, being a fungal infection, it's been associated with travelers hospitalized in other countries. All of these drug-resistant infections have serious impl implications for the public's health in the United States and for our healthcare system as a whole. So what's new in travel medicine? As I just discussed, we're expecting to see a peak, a peak in dengue cases in 2019. Earlier this month, the FDA approved the use of a vaccine called Dengvaxia, a live attenuated vaccine that protects against all four of the virus serotypes that I mentioned. So the announcement of a vaccine is good news, right? Well, it is, but before we get too excited about using this vaccine in travelers, let's take a look at the indications and contraindications. Dengvaxia is indicated for use in children between the ages of nine and 16 who are already living in endemic areas and who have laboratory confirmation of a previous dengue infection. In people who haven't been infected before, the vaccine actually seems to increase the risk of severe dengue, so that's not good. We're not expecting dengvaxia to have much applicability for the majority of international travelers, but we'll have to wait and see. Now, yellow fever vaccine isn't new. And from time to time, there have been shortages in supply here in the United States. But in 2018, the manufacturer of the only U.S. licensed FDA-approved yellow fever vaccine ran out of stock due to production issues. The manufacturer, Sanofi Pasteur, anticipated this and worked with the FDA to make an alternative vaccine available, a vaccine called Stamiril equal in efficacy and safety to YFVAX and made by Sanofi Pasteur in France. But because of the legal issues surrounding the use of an imported non-FDA approved, non approved drug, the number of clinics that now provide yellow fever vaccine has decreased by an order of magnitude and then some, from around 4,000 locations down to about 260. So our advice, CDC's advice, has been for international travelers planning to go to areas where there is risk of yellow fever to plan far in advance of their travel to get their vaccine. And if they can't get the vaccine, we're encouraging them to modify their travel plans. Yellow fever is a potentially deadly disease. Sanofi Pasteur is going to have more information about when YFX will again be available later in 2019. So stand by. Zika isn't exactly a new topic to travel medicine either. And we've been dealing with the public health response to this illness for a good couple of years now, since the large outbreak in the Americas. But what is new are the updated recommendations that CDC has developed in partnership with the World Health Organization and the European Centers for Disease Control, ECDC. 
The changes in our recommendations were predicated on the challenges to doing good Zika surveillance. One, Zika is frequently mild or asymptomatic, so it's hard to know clinically if someone's been infected or not. Two, since the illness is mild or asymptomatic, infected people may not even seek care. Three, the ability to conduct confirmatory laboratory testing may be limited depending on where a person lives. And four, positive tests may not be reported in a timely way or at all. So taken together, a lack of reported cases does not mean that there isn't a risk of infection at a particular location or destination. So based on these limitations, what did we do? Well, as I said, the CDC, WHO, and ECDC got together to update the Zika travel recommendations as follows. Countries that have ever reported Zika, and yes, that includes the United States, are now considered to always have some level of potential risk. The vector's there, and the virus may be circulating, even at very low or indeterminate levels. The CDC also no longer recommends that pregnant women avoid all travel to the purple countries that you see on the map. Instead, public health agencies are encouraging pregnant women to speak with a trusted healthcare provider to discuss their level of comfort with the risk of travel and the potential consequences to the pregnancy. What you don't see on this slide, but what's also a part of the recommendations and hasn't changed, is that pregnant women are not to travel to areas where there are ongoing identified outbreaks of Zika. In malaria, a new drug was recently approved by the US Food and Drug Administration for the prophylaxis and radical cure of Plasmodium vivax malaria. Radical cure is the name given to the additional dose of medication given to people who are leaving an endemic area in an effort to eradicate any malaria protozoans that may still be circulating and that haven't been completely eradicated by the prophylactic drug. The advantage of tofenaquin, this new drug, is that it is a long half-life, meaning that travelers don't have to take it as often. The disadvantage is that, like another quin prophylaxis drug, primaquin, it can cause severe hemolytic anemia in people with G6PD deficiency, so testing is required before prescribing. But it is the first new malaria drug to come on the market in many years, and it offers another alternative to people traveling to areas where Plasmodium vivax is endemic. So let's talk a little bit now about planning for healthy international travel. Pre-travel preparation begins at least a month before travel. We encourage people who are going internationally to get their recommended vaccines, any medications they may need, and important advice on healthy travel, things like food and water safety, how to protect themselves against insect bites, traffic safety. Many people, in fact, more people that are, uh, than are injured uh, or that are taken ill are injured in traffic accidents every year. We also encourage people to get inf uh, special information uh, if they fall into a special population, for example, pregnant women, families with children, or immunocompromised travelers. It's also important to plan not only for healthy travel, but safe and secure travel as well. So in addition to uh, CDC's resources, uh, that we will talk about later. We also encourage people to uh, get in contact with the, uh, the nearest U.S. Embassy or consulate using the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program, or STEP, which is available from the U.S. State Department. And we encourage people to leave copies of their passport, credit cards, et cetera, with someone back home in the event that they run into some sort of difficulty. It's important to pack a health kit. So that means important items to prevent and treat common injuries and illnesses, things like Band-Aids or um, uh, other supplies that you may need on your trip um, in case you get blisters or in case uh, other things happen to you while you're away and you may not be able to access them depending upon where you are. Uh, 
We encourage people to take their prescription medications with them because you can't always be assured that you're going to get the medicine that you take at your destination or that it's the actual medication that you're supposed to be taking. You want to make sure that you take enough with you and that you have extra in case of delays. We also encourage people to take another, an extra pair of prescription eyeglasses if they need it. And as I said, don't assume that anything that you're familiar with or comfortable with or able to get here at home, you're going to be able to get when you're traveling internationally. It's also important to know when to seek medical care while you're traveling abroad. If you have diarrhea and a high fever above 102 degrees Fahrenheit, that would be an indication. Bloody diarrhea, another. Fever or a flu-like illness and you're in a malaria area, even if you're taking malaria prophylaxis, could be the early signs of malaria infection and it's important to seek medical care. Anytime you're bitten or scratched by an animal is another concern. And of course, trauma of any sort, whether it be uh, a motor vehicle accident, uh, an assault, uh, those are also reasons for seeking appropriate medical attention. One of the things that the CDC recommends is that people get travel insurance before they go. And there are a variety of types of travel insurance. So there's medical coverage, there's trip insurance, and then of course there is medical evacuation insurance. So if you're going somewhere where uh, you may be involved in uh, rigorous activity or climbing uh, or areas where you may be at greater risk and there may be a chance that you need to be evacuated, or if you have a health condition that may uh, put you at additional risk, you may want to consider getting a package that allows you to uh, tap into those resources to get you out of harm's way uh, or to get you to medical care uh, that you're more familiar with or more accustomed to in order to help you out. I'd like to now end up the talk uh, spending a little bit of time talking about some CDC resources and some uh, other ways of being connected with the topic of uh, travel medicine. As Kelly said at the outset, we have a reference for healthcare providers and others who are advising travelers, the CDC Yellow Book or Health Information for International Travel. It's available both in hard copy and online and you can see the link there on your screen. Um, or as I said, you can purchase it in hard copy from Oxford University Press. The 2020 edition is now available um, for sale or I think they're taking pre-orders uh, at a variety of publishers, at the publisher's website as well as uh, at places like amazon.com. So you can get a copy for your own reference. The Traveler's Health website is another excellent place to go for information, which we frequently update. It provides specific topics like food and water safety, insect bite prevention, road safety. It also addresses, as I said, special groups of travelers, children, pregnant women, uh, people with uh, other uh, health underlying health conditions, senior citizens, etc., and how that they can prepare for healthy international travel. And we also address specific groups like business travelers, adventure travelers, students who are traveling abroad, um, and all of those groups have special uh, unique pages on our Traveler's Health website. The Travel Health Notices, which I mentioned at the beginning and said I would get to, is another way that we have here at the CDC of alerting people to situations that may be going on internationally. The travel health notices, or travel notices for short, are designed to inform people who are living or going abroad and the people who are responsible for their care about current health issues related to specific destinations. And these issues can arise from disease outbreaks, special events or gatherings, natural disasters, or other conditions that can affect travelers' health. You can see there on the screen, we've got them divided into three different categories, level one or watch, in which we are encouraging people to follow their usual precautions. People should be vaccinated against measles. So if you're going somewhere where there's a measles outbreak, or if you're traveling anywhere for that matter, you should be vaccinated against measles. You may want to know that there's a measles outbreak going on at a particular destination, but you should be protected before you even get on that plane to go there. Level two, or an alert, 
would be an example of using an enhanced enhanced precautions. In other words, there may be gr particular groups who are susceptible or uh, may be at risk for uh, something, or they may need to take special precautions before they go. And an example of that would be rubella infection in pregnant travelers. So if a woman has not been vaccinated against rubella, she's pregnant and she travels to a place where a uh, rubella epidemic is going on, or a rubella outbreak is going on and she gets infected, it can have serious consequences for her pregnancy. So we wanna make sure that we call additional attention to those kinds of situations. And then finally, we have the warning or level three, which is shown in red, which is to avoid non-essential travel. And an example of that might be the Ebola epidemic, uh, or sometimes we'll actually put up a warning in situations where there's been severe political unrest or uh, where there's been a severe natural disaster that has so adversely impacted the ability to provide resources uh, where the hospitals are impacted, uh, where there may not be clean water available, uh, where we'll encourage people really not to travel there uh, certainly not if they're going for any reason other than to serve in a humanitarian aid or relief capacity. We also have our destination pages. And the destination pages are divided into uh, clinician and traveler uh, oriented materials, easy to read, and we provide information on all the things that we've been talking about, food and water safety, insect bite precautions, other things like that, what to pack. Uh, we'll also put up if there are travel notices. And this is where you can go if you want to know the specific, uh, more information about the specific destination where you're going, you can go directly to that page and get all the information that you need uh, for any country around the globe. We have print materials for travelers in English and in Spanish. Uh, you see the web link there. Simply go to the web page, select travel health from the, pro from the programs drop down menu, and you can view the different uh, print materials that we have available. We also have mobile apps on our website, Can I Eat This and CDC Travel which are two uh, excellent resources that you can actually take with you on the go and access from your mobile device. Uh, if you're somewhere and you're not sure, is this something that I wanna eat? Is this something that I should avoid? Uh, what's the risk to me of eating this? That's a great thing. The Travel also provides a lot of resources in terms of um, where you're going, uh, giving you information about risks and what you can do in order to mitigate those risks. Uh, another excellent resource. So you can stay in touch with us here at the CDC and the Travelers Health Branch uh, through a variety of mechanisms. We have a newsletter and travel notice alerts, and you can see the link there where you can uh, subscribe. CDC Info is another way of being in touch with us, and every day we field uh, both calls and email messages from the public, from providers, from people who have traveled, from loved ones who want to know more information about a particular destination or the impact of, uh, of international travel on someone. Uh, and we're there available to respond uh, to anything that may be escalated our way. Uh, those, phone, those phones are um, staffed by uh, operators who have trained in, pro in providing you with a response, if they don't know the answer, they send it to us and we'll be able to get back to you with the information. Finally, our Travelers Health Branch has a variety of social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Figure One. Uh, all of those are ways in which our communication team shares information about the work that we're doing, about disease outbreaks, and other information about how to stay healthy during international travel. So that's about it for today. Uh, a quick whirlwind, perhaps, of uh, tr international traveler health in uh, 2019. But uh, thank you for tuning in, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Jeff. We will now transition to our Q&A session. Jonathan, can you read the first question? Hi everyone. <clears throat> so our first question uh, comes from an, an anonymous attendee who says, please advise of when newly developed shingles vaccine, um, Shingrix, will be available overseas. 
um, <clears throat> just particularly interested in Southeast Asia or Thailand. Also, if vaccinated against measles in infancy is another that is a booster required when uh, going to a measles endemic zone? So the answer to the first question is, I don't know. Uh, perhaps we can uh, try and get that information for this uh, caller or for the uh, for the person who's asking the question. I don't know when available when drugs will become available internationally. Um, as far as the second question about uh, a baby being vaccinated in infancy, if a child is or an infant is vaccinated before the age of one. So, for example, we do have the recommendation that infants between the ages of six months and 12 months, if they're traveling internationally, they get a shot of measles vaccine. That's to protect them during their travel. But that only covers them for a short period of time. And once they turn one, they need to get the full measles series. As long as they've had both measles shots, as prescribed according to the uh, ACIP, um, that person should be protected for life. And that is the current recommendations that we're giving people. Thank you. The next question comes from Caroline, <clears throat> who apparently is uh, planning a trip both to Bolivia and then to uh, West Africa, mm -hmm. who asks um, about taking doxycycline for uh, uh, the trip to Bolivia Mm -hmm. uh, for malaria, and then taking malarone uh, when going to West Africa, and can they be taken at the same time? Uh, they can be taken at the same time, but they don't cover the same. Uh, they don't cover the same organisms, and so it's important that she work with her healthcare provider to make sure that uh, she's taking the right anti-malarial for the region of the world and for the, uh, for the likely uh, protozoan that she'll be exposed to when she's traveling. It's also important to know that um, doxycycline can predispose people to um, uh, sun sensitivity. So uh, it's also important to be uh, concerned about that. But it sounds like she's may have already spoken to somebody and has the information that she needs to know where to take what drug and when to take it. So I th it sounds like she's in pretty good shape. Okay, there won't be any problems with overlap if she merely goes from one location to the other. No, she just needs to make sure <clears throat> that she starts the medication in advance of entering an area where she's going to be at risk and that she continues to take the medication after she's left that area uh, for any potential residual infection that uh, she may have, uh, but her healthcare provider should be able to provide her with the specific dosing uh, and prescribing information. Great, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Kathy Bridson, who asks, can you speak to the need for measles vaccine for someone who is 56 years old and will be traveling internationally if they know that they were vaccinated as a child according to the normal schedule, but do not know their immune status. Is a booster recommended? Um, right now, as I said, um, the current recommendations, and we can pull those up again. Um, Stephanie's looking, so I have to go back to the okay. slides real quick. That's all right. Kathy, I hope um, you're looking forward to your trip. We'll have the rec recommendations up shortly. So as long as someone has had um, two doses separated by 28 days, uh, that would be an indication of uh, appropriate immunity. Um, we also recommend that if someone has only one dose, uh, which, may, which was the case, uh, before uh, 1989 uh, that that person get a second dose. So it, de it all depends on when that shot was given um, and uh, whether they got those doses before or after that, that cutoff date when, uh, when the second dose was added to the prescribing regimen. Okay, so <clears throat> the next question comes from Jean Collins who asks, 
a, a, Gene is asking what brought about the change for yellow fever such that now um, only, it only requires one dose. I didn't understand the question. Could you repeat that? Yes. What brought about the change for yellow fever for now only uh, requiring one dose? So uh, that was looked at by both the World Health Organization as well as uh, the CDC. And by looking at uh, large numbers of people who had received the yellow fever vaccine, they were able to find evidence that those people were adequately protected or had adequate had evidence of adequate immunity uh, long after the 10 years that uh, had previously been recommended. It used to be recommended that someone get a yellow fever vaccine every 10 years if they were going into uh, a yellow fever endemic area. And then, uh, as I said, both, the public, both public health agencies, WHO and CDC, uh, made the determination that that was in fact uh, no longer the case. Now, there is a little bit of a difference between what CDC and WHO recommends in that uh, uh, with CDC in particular, if you are travel, if you had a shot more than 10 years ago and you are now traveling into an area where there is an outbreak or there is a much greater preponderance of yellow fever infection above baseline than normal, CDC recommends that people consider getting a booster dose, uh, but that's a decision that would be made in conjunction with a travel health professional. In most cases, for people who are traveling internationally, the one dose is sufficient. Great, okay, and we also have um, <clears throat> a couple of questions about hepatitis A and B. Mm -hmm. uh, one person asks if there are any updates or changes on the hepatitis A and B precautions. And another commentator, this is Caroline again, mm -hmm. who asks if it is true that hepatitis A and B vaccines now last for life and don't need boosters. Um, I'm going to have to go and look that up, and I can, I'd be happy to get back to her on that. Uh, but the last that I'm aware... Um, I, I don't recall hearing anything new on that recently, but if, the, if she has specifics, um, she can reach out to us through CDC info or through uh, whatever links it is that you provide to uh, the people who are tuning into this webinar. We'd be happy to get back to her on that. And that is epic, E-P-I-C, at cdc.gov. And if <clears throat> this happens sometimes where a question may come in that's just a little bit off of um, the focus of the webinar, and we're happy to follow up and forward those questions on to presenters or other people as appropriate within the organization. Okay. Um, so our next, uh, we have two comments from Annette Dandy, mm -hmm. who is traveling soon to Tanzania. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Annette is wondering what vaccines would be needed or if that's hard to recall for every single country off the top of your head, just a reminder of how to acquire that information. Mm -hmm. And also Annette is wondering if Ebola is a threat in Tanzania and before you answer, um, I just want to comment, Annette, we're actually doing a webinar on the Ebola crisis in uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo next month. That'll be the June webinar. So um, I can answer your question specifically about Tanzania, but what I'd rather do is instruct you to go to the CDC website. Um, I think there's a lot of information there that you can get that um, I won't be able to necessarily communicate over the, uh, over the phone or over the line. And just sort of going around the website and finding information, I think you may, you may get something out of it more than me just sort of listing what vaccines or, or what medications you might need. So I would encourage you to take a look at the, the CDC website or look at the, look at the yellow book. Um, and, and if you have, again, if you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer them. But I would encourage you to um, poke around a little bit and, and see what you can get on that. Um, as far as Ebola goes, uh, to the best of my knowledge, right now, uh, the outbreak is limited to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, we are obviously monitoring uh, all the countries that surround the DRC, um, but to the, to the best of my knowledge, Tanzania is not currently impacted by that outbreak. Okay, we have another question. Um, <clears throat> are meningitis B vaccines indicated for certain population groups? Uh, we don't generally recommend meningitis B for travelers. Uh, meningitis B uh, is 
uh, unless there's a known outbreak of meningitis B in a particular destination, uh, generally we uh, recommend the quadrivalent, uh, which I believe is A, C, Y, and W are the serotypes uh, of meningitis vaccine that we recommend for people who are going to uh, meningitis endemic countries or for people who are traveling to the Hajj, where it's a requirement by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that people are vaccinated against meningitis. Uh, but meningitis B is not one that we typically recommend as a routine traveler vaccine. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a question about taking malarone or other malaria prophylaxis long term, as in greater than six months. Mm -hmm. um, are any concerns? Uh, in fact, no. Um, and there are people who are in areas where uh, malaria is endemic who are going to be spending more than six months in that area, and we want to make sure that people are adequately protected. Our concern, in fact, is in people who stop taking their medications too early, uh, and then they are at increased risk for infection with a potentially lethal disease. Um, so uh, none that I can think of. Sometimes it seems like people who don't live in malaria affected areas may not, oftentimes may not realize how serious malaria is worldwide. Well, and uh, even people who live in those areas uh, for whom uh, they believe that they can develop some immunity to the disease, which isn't true, um, or they believe that uh, they're somehow at lesser risk. And in fact, it's one of the things that we encounter in uh, what's called the VFR, or Visiting Friends and Relatives population. There are many, many people in this country who take the opportunity to travel home to visit family, uh, friends, relatives, and the family, friends, and relatives live in malarious areas. Uh, and people will travel, they won't take their malaria medication, and that they will become infected while they're there. Uh, so it's hard to get that message out, you're right, uh, but it's important that people do take their medications properly and, and as prescribed in order to, to fight off that infection. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> earlier, we received a particularly interesting question from John Sanders. He asked, what about <clears throat> warning people about feral dogs especially in India and the Philippines? Uh, it's a great point. We know that rabies is a big problem. It's a big killer in places around the world, uh, including in Africa and in other countries. And so, yes, it's absolutely important to make sure that people stay away from uh, feral animals. Uh, many of those countries don't have adequate vaccination programs for the animals, and as a consequence, uh, rabies can be spread fairly easily. And that includes uh, puppies and kittens as well. So people think you have to be uh, a, an older dog in order to, it has to be an older dog or an older cat that can transmit the disease. That's not true. It's not just from bats. Um, it can be uh, an animal licking an open wound. So an animal doesn't even necessarily have to display what we would consider to be the classic signs of rabies with the, the angry posturing and the foaming at the mouth. An, an animal can be completely asymptomatic or without uh, demonstrating any signs of the illness uh, and still be capable of transmitting uh, the virus to, to people. And uh, Rabies is a very serious threat. It's one of the things that we encourage people who may be doing uh, wilderness activities or going out into areas where um, they may have a greater risk of exposure. Those people may be candidates for pre-exposure prophylaxis for rabies. And that would be something that, again, we would encourage people to go visit with their travel health provider before they leave the country, let them know what their planned activities are, let them know what the destination is, and uh, make appropriate plans to get the vaccine if they're going to be at higher risk. And we know that some people are going to be in that category. So thanks okay. for the question. It's a good one. And following up on that, um, what is, uh, Mr. Jacomi asks, what is the length um, or duration of protection for the rabies? For the rabies vaccine. I, you know what? I don't remember. I don't remember that one. Uh, okay. I don't, I, that's okay, though. Um, okay. If you, if you well, send the question to epic at cdc.gov, we will follow up and get, get that information back to you. All right. Well, a little angel just whispered in my ear, three shots is good for the lifetime. Oh, okay. Um, so, we had, this is a little bit of a point. 
difficult question, but it seems pretty relevant. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee who asks, um, our clinic provides Cipro and azithromycin for traveler's diarrhea. Mm -hmm. You mentioned resistance to these antibiotics. Should they consider changing this practice? Well, our guidance is that for mild diarrhea, we don't recommend that people take antibiotics at all. That in most cases, uh, mild diarrhea gets taken care of uh, on its own. The body's flora will uh, correct whatever problem. The issue is when somebody develops, as we said, either diarrhea and a high fever or bloody diarrhea. And those are instances where people probably shouldn't be trying to take care of it take care of the problem on their own. That's a situation where people probably need to be getting medical attention so that uh, proper diagnosis can be made and proper antibiotics can be prescribed. Uh, and that's, that's sort of the, I think that the thinking on treatment and management of traveler's diarrhea, uh, prophylaxis of traveler's diarrhea, uh, and, and its ultimate management, that's an evolving field. It's a very interesting one. But right now, I think our current recommendation is for people who have mild traveler's diarrhea uh, to ride it out as best they can. Uh, it, it usually resolves within a period of about three days um, and not to prophylax against. Uh, so I think that Giving people ciprofloxacin and azithromycin may be contributing to antibiotic resistance, um, depending upon the uh, organism, the causative organism, and that depends on where in the world that person may be. Um, so I think, yes, I think that looking at the literature and encouraging the people at that clinic to think a little, uh, a little bit more about what, it, what their practices are, I think that would be encouraged and recommended at, at this time. Okay, and if you have, for these kind of clinical questions, if you have a more detailed follow-up question, if you send that to epic at cdc.gov, I will forward that on to Dr. Neumhauser for more, uh, for more detailed discussion. Okay, um, <clears throat> see what time it is, yeah, we're doing good. Okay, uh, do you recommend that travelers, everyone, receive the Twinrex vaccine for hepatitis A and B rather than separate hepatitis A and B series? Do I have a preference is, uh, for twin ricks versus separate vaccines? Mm -hmm. I don't. I think it, my opinion is that people who are traveling internationally uh, should have both vaccines, and however they get it is how I would recommend that they get it. Okay. So I've been holding on to this question because I know it might um, evoke a longer answer, but the, the, the question regards cruise ships and noroviruses. Mm. Um, can you just comment on that? Maybe what travelers should be thinking about? Um, well, I think it's a, let's put it this way. It's a big enough of an issue that CDC has a whole team of people, the Vessel Sanitation Program, who do almost nothing but look at norovirus on cruise ships. So uh, it, it's, a, it's certainly a big issue. I think the best thing that people can do is, as we encourage everyone, to practice really scrupulous uh, hand hygiene. So really washing hands very well with uh, warm water and soap. Uh, when they can't get to, when they don't have a ready source of uh, soap and water to use hand sanitizers, alcohol-based hand sanitizers, um, and to be you know very careful about the things that they eat. But we know that norovirus is very easily spread. We know that norovirus can uh, go through ships uh, very easily and can, in fact, go through several cycles of cruises. Uh, so I'm not encouraging people not to take cruises. Uh, I think people should go and have a good time. I think they just need to think carefully about, uh, again, making sure that they keep their hands clean, making sure that they keep their hands away from their, their nose and their mouth, uh, except for when they're eating, um, and uh, to, just to be cautious about the, the food that they eat. The other thing that I wanna bring up just really quickly, some people believe that um, drinking alcoholic beverages, uh, if there's, you know, they've heard that, well, maybe there's bacteria in the water, bacteria in the ice, and that somehow the alcohol in the beverages will uh, kill the infection. In fact, that's not true. So uh, it's, it's also uh, possible to, to transmit infections that way as well. So um, all of those things are things for people to think about and, and look out for. It's possible that's an excuse to drink more alcohol. It's Just... possible. Um, <clears throat> a follow-up question for myself about that topic. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about hygiene practices, 
I understand that it protects people, say, if they get a, some virus particles on their hands, mm. maybe they wash their hands before they touch their food or touch their mouth. Does it also help protect other people? That is, does it interrupt spread of the disease? Hmm. Well, if, if you think of uh, the fact that uh, there are fomites or that there are these particles that are infectious and if we pick them up on our hands and then we touch someone else, then theoretically that fomite can be spread from one person to another that way. Um, so I guess, yeah, I guess that's, a, that's another way of thinking of uh, helping to protect the public's health as well as your own. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me see, it's 152, so we can take a couple more. Uh, do you have any recommendations, this is from Gene, any recommendations for altitude sickness? Uh, in fact, there are recommendations for altitude sickness. Um, again, I, I would strongly encourage you to look at the CDC website. We have a whole chapter on altitude sickness in the uh, yellow book uh, that will give you a lot of details about that. And in fact, there are a lot of different ways of treating altitude sickness, um, depending upon what form of the illness that you're getting, uh, depending on uh, where you are, uh, what I would what I would encourage you to do, again, is to not only look at that reference that we have uh, on our CDC website, but to talk to a travel professional. So if you're going trekking, say you're going to, the, uh, to Nepal, or if you're going to climb Kilimanjaro, um, you know, the, the one that people think of most often is acetazolamide, but there are others that are available, and you want to think about what those are depending upon what form of altitude sickness you're prone to or what form of altitude sickness you have, whether it's primarily um, pulmonary, whether it's neurological, um, different regimens can be tailored to the particular condition. And so I think it's important to make sure that you not only look at our resources, but speak specifically to a clinical provider, to a clinician who can make sure that you get the right medications for yourself and that you know how to take them and when to take them. Uh, of course, the most important thing for altitude sickness, uh, for severe altitude sickness, is to come down from altitude. Um, and so uh, that's that's the thing that we always encourage people to do if the medications aren't working or uh, if getting additional oxygen supplementation isn't helpful. But all of those things are spelled out, uh, as I say, on our website or if you have an opportunity and we strongly encourage you to make the opportunity to meet with uh, before travel with a, a travel health medicine specialist. And um, <clears throat> yes, well, it looks like we're running low on time here, but I am going to, um, we had one follow-up on the hand washing, which was if you had a preference of soap and water for hand hygiene or using like a sanitizer of some kind. That's a great question. Our recommendation is to uh, always use soap and water uh, if available. Clean, soap and wa uh, clean water and soap is really your best choice. Um, and then alcohol-based sanitizers is, is, is second uh, and can be used as a supplemental measure, but uh, soap and water I think is always number one. Great, and um, looks like we have one more time for one more um, <clears throat> and then we'll close down. And this is, um, for people who are border dwellers, uh, are there any, and I imagine that would apply to borders in many different locations around the world, mm -hmm. are there any different concerns living next to a different country? Um, I, people coming across the border, or maybe there's different practices in different countries, that kind of thing. Um, you know, what we tell people is that diseases don't know borders. So you can put up a fence or you can put up a barrier, but if the disease is endemic to a region and the uh, topography, if the climate, if the environment is conducive um, on both sides of the border, then somebody's going to be susceptible to those infections uh, or those diseases or whatever conditions may exist on either side of the border. Um, we've certainly seen that in, in many instances. And so I don't know that someone who's living on a border specifically has particular or unique concerns um, other than to be aware of really what's going on on both sides of that border because uh, on either side there may be things going on that could affect their health. Okay. Um, 
looks like we have three and a half minutes. My colleagues are asking that we ask a question that came in from the chat section. Okay. A little bit harder to see, but um, does the CDC endorse the use of face masks when traveling, especially for air travel? Uh, we don't, in fact, endorse the use of face masks during travel, um, but that is a personal decision that we leave to uh, individuals and to their healthcare providers. Some people like to use uh, face masks for, say, for example, if they're going to an area where there's a lot of air pollution um, in order to screen the air pollution or the particulates out of the air as they're breathing. Um, or some people may use them to try and filter out viruses or things like that. Viruses are extremely small and probably aren't going to be adequately screened by whatever sort of a face mask that somebody can uh, pick up at the, at the store, at the drug store. Um, and, but it, it, the decision about whether to wear a face mask or not, we leave that to the individual. That's not something where CDC has a, a policy or a, an endorsement uh, one way or the other. Okay, thank you. I'm going to um, hand it back over to Kelly now, and thank you, everyone. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar. If you have additional questions, you may email them to epic at cdc.gov. As a reminder, today's presentation has been recorded, and you can earn continuing education units for your participation. Please follow the instructions found on emergency.cd. Access code is EPIC E P I C 0522 with all letters capitalized. Thank you again, everyone. Goodbye.